there, uh, and, and it's a it's a it's a sea of acronyms, most of which I, I don't even remember, and what they exactly what they stand for. But um, the two big things um, in terms of web services, or at least from sort of my perspective, are SOAP and XMLRPC, and they both do approximately the same thing, which is they take a chunk of data, um, encode it in XML, and then use that to drive commands on another machine and then return more data. Um, the development that I'm doing is with XML RPC, so that's what I know the most about, so that's kind of what I'm going to, to talk, about, uh, talk about the most. Um, XML RPC stands for Extensible Markup Language, Remote Procedure Calls, and, um, and it was developed uh, a few years back as a way to um, for, for folks to uh, move, uh, move data around. Um, and it's actually uh, widely used in the blogging. If anybody does blogging and you're doing anything with, um, uh, with like sort of remote clients that send information to your blog, um, or if you're doing things with, when you, when, you, um, uh, when you post your blog, it pings another site to let that site know that you posted so you get on the great big long list of all the sites that have recently updated. Um, that, uh, that communication is being done with XML RPC. Um, if you're running Linux servers, Red Hat uses XML RPC um, as the, the power behind its up-to-date service that lets you um, that lets you actually get updates to your server um, through XML RPC. So um, what we've done with uh, with Cali. Um, a big thing is um, we we have uh, we have all those lessons, right? Everybody knows about the Cali lesson. Um, we're we're getting really close to 500 now. And back in you know a few years ago, there were 200 lessons, and it was easy to have them listed on a page someplace. Um, you know, and it wasn't even that long. You could sort of scroll down and you could contrast and you could see what's in it. Um, and they also didn't change that often. New lessons came out once a year, maybe. It was static for a long time. Now our production system is a lot more dynamic. So new lessons are getting added <coughs> quarterly, let's say. And we're not quite up to monthly yet, but quarterly. So three or four times a year, there are new lessons. And almost monthly, there are lessons with changes. You know, an author's made a change because the law has changed, or we found an error that's been corrected. Um, excuse me, not an error, misinterpretation of something <laughs> that's been that's been straightened out. Um, you know, so so we have it's pretty dynamic. So uh, when you want to have a list of all of those um, all of those uh, things together. Um, you know, you want to know what the latest list of, of lessons are. And we actually have two people, not people, two organizations that make extensive use of the list, of the list for Cal. And that's, that's TWIN, where the Cal, and, and Lexis Web Courses, where the, the list of lessons are built right in. Um, the way that we got those lists into TWIN and Blackboard um, was labor intensive, to say the least. Um, and not fun, and you know, and, and was just like sort of pointless. So, I mean, to spend so much time doing it and having to do it over and over and over and over again, just to make my minor changes. So, so we developed this actually initially to solve the to solve the, the list update problem with Twin, um, because they were they were willing to uh, to implement this right away, um, which turned out to be nine months. But that's what it is. Fast. Um, but but they're using it now to update so that the list of lessons that you see on Twin, if you're selecting Cali lessons, is always accurate up to like right now. So whenever we add a lesson, it automatically starts refreshing the list. And it's XML RPC that lets us do that. Um, now, uh, just sort of give you an idea of what's uh, of what it looks like. OK, 
Okay, this is at Emory. So if I click on the Cali link here, you basically see this is the list of, 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 of our categories for our lessons. And then I can pick a category. And then that gives me the list of lesson titles. And then I can click on that, and it gives me the information about it and a um, and the link to then just go and run the lesson. Okay. Now the thing is, is that that's exactly the same information that's available on the Cali website, obviously, because you know, we have it. But it's embedded in Emory's website. So that one of the things about XML RPC and with web services is, is that you get access to the information. So I set up like a series of access points for the information. And then you, or somebody in your IT staff, writes some little bits of scripting. In this case, this was PHP. Um, but virtually every language that you care to think of can, can be used to access, um, can be used to access the, uh, the web services. Um, you know, .NET and um, the folks from Twin did it in .NET. Um, people have written it implementations in Python and Ruby and Perl. Um, you should be able to do it in JavaScript and active server pages and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, not to mention regular programming languages like C++ and Java and things like that too. Um, but what it does is it gives you the ability to provide this information to your students directly in your website. You don't have to tell them to go to Cali to look this stuff up. They can just go to your website. They're probably already there anyway. Um, and, and track the stuff down, and they don't get hassled with the login box and all that stuff until they get to the point where they actually want to run a lesson, and it says, you know, you need to log in and, and do all that, all that sort of stuff. Okay. Now, basically, the um, the code that that does that it just basically sits there and just waits for you to ask it questions because that's what that's what XML RPC does. It's a sort of a uh, uh, like a challenge and response sort of thing. You write software that asks it a question. Show me all of the current categories that Cali has, and it returns the list of categories. And then you say, well, okay, for a given category, show me all the lessons, and then it gives you a list of lessons. And then for a given title, give me the description. Now you can combine all of that stuff if you get really complicated. So you can show, you know, you could actually write something that, that pulls the information out that looks like the printed catalog that we used to send out. Where, you know, it has the categories and then the titles and the description all on one page. So all that's possible. Okay. Now the reason why we would want to do this is not so that I can work shorter hours, um, but but so that you could use that information in ways that fit what you're doing. Okay, um, so so you could um, you could query the system just to get say you have a, se a set of um, uh, library uh, online resource pages, and you want to list you know you're listing online resources for stuff. And you want to include on your tax resources page a list of all the Cali lessons that are available in tax, of which there are about to be like 147 more. Um, you could do that in a way so that the list then that shows up on, on, that, on that page is always up to date. It's always current. You don't need to go back and, um, and change it all. Because I know a lot of you here have pages about Cali on your website. I've seen them. They were written in 1995. <laughs> you know, like one of the first things you put up on the web was like, well, we've got this Cali stuff, and they've got stuff on the web, so we'll make this Cali page. And you put it there, and, and there it is, right? I mean, why do we need to go back and, and change the information about Cali? Well, you know, I won't. I won't go and visit anybody's Cali pages, but but the, but there are there are you know you look at some of them and it says you know Cali is a collection of a hundred lessons in 
you know, 17 different areas of the law. And here's the password, learn the law, and, and you can go there and, 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 run the, and run the lessons. Well, none of that information is, is current anymore. And, and, um, and so students may look at that and they go and they try to learn the law password and that doesn't work and all blows up and then, you know, and then they, just, and they just get confused. But it's hard to maintain those sort of static web pages. Um, and until now, you didn't have any reliable way to always get a new updated list of what's available on Cali all the time. Um, the, the, uh, uh, the software that, um, that we have, um, like the example that I have in PHP, I'm more than willing to share with anybody who wants to, to sort of incorporate that into, into what they're doing. Um, you know, the, 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 page that I, the page that I showed you um, from, uh, from Emory, the, uh, the, the librarian at Emory, Will Haynes, who's in charge of the library website, uh, knows nothing about PHP. Well, actually, he knows a tiny little bit about PHP, mostly what he learned in, in working with this. But it took him, you know, he's good at doing web and, and that sort of stuff. And it, it took him an afternoon to look at my sample you know, software, plug it into the, the, uh, the template that they have. Um, and and uh, other schools have done it too. We've got, to give you an idea of how it, and here's an implementation, and this is a lot more basic. It does, you know, it works basically the same way. Uh, that's Rutgers Camden. I think the Duke. Right, Duke fits it in. And so, so you've got all the, you know, all of the regular, you know, all of your local navigation uh, features, but our, our lessons, or links to our lessons. This is uh, Marquette. And see, they've gotten a little bit fancy. They've got little arrows and different things going on. Don't think anybody went. So, you know, it's not it's not a difficult thing to do. Um, and, and we'd be, you know, and the thing is, is when we add those brand new tax lessons. Um, When you're at the, when you click on tax law, right now it shows two things. You know, in a month when we've finished processing all these the tax lessons that we're adding, this list will be like 150 titles long. But the folks in Marquette won't have to do anything. You know, they'll just, it'll just be there. Um, we also have a mailing list, by the way, for folks. Um, that you can you can get to from the from the Cali website. They will send you an email whenever we add new lessons. Um, so then you know then that way because you, know, you don't always want to sort of you know get caught off guard by the, the student who pops in and says, "Wow, I was just looking at those 150 tax lessons that Cali has out." <laughs> um, so that's um, that's one uh, one little way that that XML RPC can uh, can work. And basically, what that does is, it's, it's, and really, what I'm doing is, is essentially giving you access to the Cali database, um, so that you can incorporate that data into your, um, into your page. And we're going to expand this a little bit to include more information about, like we don't have any author information in here right now, um, so that I'll oh, see. They actually did get kind of fancy. He's added information. You know, he sort of put the title in a separate. You know, in a separate box so that it has a different a different color to it, and that um, and that kind of thing. Um, well, the other thing that this does is the run this lesson link is actually part of what what we give out from the database, and it points to the most like if there's a flash version of the lesson, which about ninety percent of lessons now are available in flash. It points to that. And if there's no flash version, that points to the web version. If there's no web version, that points to the Windows version. If there's no Windows version, that points to the DOS version. Um, 
if there's a DOS version. Um, if there's a Mac version, I think I just do something bad and ignore it. I forget. I don't know. And no, actually, I return the data. The data is all in there about like which. Um, actually, I think it, I think the, the system returns all the version information, so you could actually expand that run this lesson thing and actually put the entire range because some are available in Windows, the web, and in Flash. At least at the moment. So, so that's that's one way that we're using um, using XML RPC and, and web services to uh, to move data around. Um, another way. That we're, that we're doing. And how many people were, uh, were just in John's class caster thing? Okay. I could demo that again. I could demo that all day long. It's fun. <laughs> um, but uh, we're, 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 we're developing a system called class caster that um, basically ties together audio and blogs um, so that you can. Um, you can, uh, one of the, 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 the real whiz bang sort of feature about it is you dial a phone number, uh, record essentially a message that could be of whatever length, um, and then save it and it gets posted to a blog automatically. Well, I've got to be able to talk between the phone system that's handling the call and the blog. And the way that that's done is um, with XML RPC, which um, the ugly details of which are actually exposed here on this, on this screen. Um, yeah, it's a pile of code that only a geek could love. But what it does is it takes a bit of information, or in this case, several bits of information, and it pulls them together, and it transfers data from one system to another. Okay, so in this case, from the system that I make the phone call to, um, that gets recorded, and then um, and then the sound gets put the, the sound the sound file gets processed, and then it gets sent to a blog. But it's doing all that behind the scenes using um, using this 67 lines of Perl. Um, and uh, what it does is it allows two systems that, that know about each other to communicate. So I can move information um, between these two things. Now the interesting thing about this, um, about this bit of Perl is, is that even though I wrote it specifically to tie the phone system to the blog, it will actually tie anything that produces audio to a blog. So if you have anything that um, if you have anything that produces a sound file that you know as sort of the end of its process it can like you know call another process which a lot of you know or you know you can well yeah you need to do that um, you can actually take that sound file and move it to that blog um, all at you know using this, this bit of software. And that's the other thing that XML RPC is really good at, um, which is moving data around. Okay. Um, now, uh, in, um, uh, in other uh, sorts of, 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 of possibilities with the same sort of thing, I mean, you could actually create an entire um, you can, you can actually create an entire website that was nothing but a series of XML RPC calls, essentially, where you just move the data around between the server and your browser. Um, and, uh, you know, the, um, the thing about it is, is that I've been doing it so long that it's not even that fascinating anymore. But the, um, but 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 it's 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 one of those it's one of those things. I mean, it, it is it is it is sort of serious. Um, it's all it is it is overview stuff. I know it's just one of those things. That, you know, gotten you know, gotten to this gotten to this level. But um, the. 
But what you could do with this sort of technology, though, in, um, you know, uh, in terms of, say, uh, libraries, you could, um, you know, you could change the way that patrons interact with the catalog, for example. Um, the, uh, you could, um, for IT departments, you could change the way that patrons interact with your help desk by having an interface that maybe talks directly to the database of, you know, for, for, your, you know, for your support system and that sort of thing in ways that, um, that they don't, you know, that, that they sort of don't do now. Um, the other thing that it does is, is it allows you to tie together sort of disparate systems. So as long as you can, as long as you can get them to agree, um, you know, in this particular case, well, in, in the case of, for example, in the case of the lessons, in the case of the lessons, we're talking about, um, you know, the, the 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 standard, so to speak, the API that that would be used is actually one that, that I wrote. So, um, you know, you can actually go and, and look at the the FAQ here, and it describes exactly what you need to do in order to get the information out of the system. So as long as you can program something, you can get that, that information out. And you notice that there's no way to put information in to the system, okay? Not through this interface, because I may be crazy. <laughs> You know, um, but it, but it's but it is. Um, I actually have hidden deep away um, a version that, uh, of an extension, or actually a, a further development on this, that will allow you to log into the site and run a lesson without ever actually visiting our website. Um, because of security issues involved with doing things like that, um, I haven't, which I haven't totally sorted out yet. Other than to know that there are security issues, um, I haven't I haven't really done much with that yet. But but it can be a two way a two way street. So this is something that allows you the information out. I could also then extend this to allow you to put information in um, through through a similar interface. Um, and the interface that. The API that the, uh, the that this software uses is called the Meta Weblog API. It was basically designed to allow some piece of software to interact with a blog, um, and and this actually allows for um, this is all information going into the blog. So I'm actually moving an MP3 file, a sound file into a resource store in a blog, and then I'm creating a new entry in a blog um, without, um, without having to do anything other than, um, you know, than just, uh, just do it. And actually, you know what? I'm going to show you because, well, because I can. Okay. This is the blog. I will take my cell phone and note that I probably don't have enough battery power, but we'll keep this. Okay, you'll see that the, the current, the uh, most recent post on there is from 2.11 um, this afternoon, which was John's uh, class, caster, class caster post. Um, so what I'm going to do here is... Uh, Call Classcaster. I'm not going to put it on speakerphone because I'm the one who did the voice menuing system, and it's a little embarrassing, <laughs> especially when it's played loudly over a over a over a really bad speakerphone. Okay, so now it's beeped, and now I'm talking, and it's going in the phone, and there's a server sitting in Atlanta that's recording this, just like voicemail. It's actually running in um, an open source uh, PBX, an open source phone system called Aspens. Um, and so I'll just talk here for a little bit, and I could go on forever. Um, 
I could use a regular phone. I could actually record an MP3 with like Audacity or something and load it directly through the web too. But this is to demonstrate the XML RPC stuff. So um, let's see, that's probably not fun. Press pound. Save it. No, that's the only thing about it. Okay. So let's see. We'll just wait for it to hang up here. Okay, it tells me to call in, but I should be able to do a refresh. Okay. 1559. And I can click here. Uh, yeah, let's play it. RPC makes all of that possible, which is to say, I, I can use my phone to create blog entries. Okay, um, so there's uh, so in any any type of situation where you know where you, where you have um, where you need to, to input information, um, you can actually use an XML RPC interface to get that data to you and, and do things with it. Um, on the other end. Like for example, you could do a, uh, you could do an admissions application using an, you know, an XML RPC thing because you can encrypt it and do, and do all sorts of uh, security things. Um, so there's, there's, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a potentials here. And right now, um, it's in the blogging world where most, well, where a lot of XML RPC and web services stuff is happening. And also in uh, business to business, uh, uh, you know, big corporation commerce type stuff. So companies that need to manage supply chains, for example, have a lot of suppliers. They're shipping a lot of data around using web services as the way to do it, as opposed to like just a plain website or um, you know or something something like that. Now one of the things that that I should mention with web services, the reason why they call them web services is because they operate on the same, you know, how uh, uh, you can, uh, they operate on, they use the same protocol as the web, HTTP is how they, is how they communicate. So they, so they work on the same port, if you will, as, um, as, uh, as a regular web server. So you can, you can tell you, basically your web server sits there listening or something like a web server sits there listening for these requests and then, pro and then knows how to process process them um, and then can do you know basically whatever the uh, the instructions um, are. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of big um, a lot of big name sort of things you may have heard about on the web have XML RPC interfaces. Um, or SOAP, which SOAP is kind of like XML RPC on steroids. So SOAP is what Microsoft and IBM did to XML RPC when they decided that it could be better. Um, and it's really complicated and I can never get it to work right. So because it wants things that, that it wants to do things that, that are like sort of way beyond the scope of what I need to do. So um, you know, depending on, on exactly what you're doing. But, but Google has, has uh, uh, XML and SOAP interfaces. Amazon has a SOAP interface. So that you can actually query Amazon and bring the results back and format them in your web page within the parameters that they lay out in their terms of service, and blah, blah, blah. But, um, but what it does is it allows you to get at their data and use it um, in ways that, that they let you um, <coughs> do without having to you know, do um, any kind of like, you know, really strange stuff. Um, so, <sighs> do you have any questions? Or do you like, how people are still, we'll start um, over here. <laughs> I, I hope this comes off as the welcome ringer question. <laughs> 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 I really don't know. Um, 
But you're talking about something text-based like mm -hmm. the uh, Cali catalog or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm having trouble wrapping my brain around what the advantage of having the data in an XML file is as opposed to having it in a relational database that the front end person could call. Well, it is in a relational database. <laughs> but you can't get at the relational database directly. Right. So, so if you, I can, of course, so I read all kinds of stuff around. But if you wanted to use the data from our database in your web page, you should say, the way that you would do it would be to get this XML and then parse the XML and, and, do, and do the layout. Is it easier front end to write than if you were doing yes. SQL equals? Yes. Okay. Because I've already done all that. So all you have to do is um, in the uh, In, in each one of these, in each one of these things, um, there's there's uh, there's a, a, a mountain of SQL. So all you need to know is is that I, I ask it to get lesson details, and I just give it a lid, which I, the, the lesson ID number that I've gotten from, a, from another query, and you don't need to know any SQL. I've already done that. So then I grab that variable and. It runs it and it gives you back XML. And it gives you back XML because you can then parse the XML and format it any way you'd like. I mean, I could give you back HTML and let you shift through and replace paragraph tag with something else or you know, do that. But it makes more sense to just do sort of a structured XML thing and then you decide where you want those. Um, you tell your parser that the title tag gets like this format, you know, and that, that sort of stuff. So, that was a good question. Um, yes? Has anyone tied it directly to their course descriptions or schedules? I mean, if I click on criminal law, I get a list of the talent lessons that would be... No, but that would be a really cool thing to do. Well, and, and you would be able to do that. Yeah. So that, so that if you had a... Right, if you had... That would be one way, That would be one really cool thing to do with this. It would be to, to tie it into, tie it into like your course catalog. Or faculty could use it on their syllabus. I mean, you could go down sort of that far, where they could um, say, you know, click here for like all the college lessons in criminal law. Or you could even go through and sort of pre-filter it for them if they're only looking for certain lessons. You know, they could actually just get specific titles. And those, and the thing is, is those links would always be um, would always be current. Um, well, you know, I think that would get the students' attention. Yeah. Yeah, because no I mean, one of the things that we know about the Cali website is, is nobody goes there other than, like, students go specifically to, like, people go there for specific stuff. You go there specifically to register for the conference. Maybe the only time all year that you visit. Don't worry, I don't take it personally. Um, but, students, but students do the same thing. They go, they either follow a link sometimes to a specific <coughs> lesson, or they go and they, they flip through real fast to, you know, they drill down the, the, the lists really quickly. And they don't spend a lot of time sort of looking around because they don't have, um, they're sort of, when they go there, they're not in browse mode. They don't see that information anywhere else. So if it was incorporated in like course descriptions and stuff, you know, because typically a student might look at that sort of stuff at sort of a more leisurely time in their life, I would hope. <laughs> um, and, and they might follow those links, yeah, and it might, might expose them to, to it a little bit more. Sure. Can you do that? Sure. Call you? Yeah, call me. Um, you you first. <laughs> yeah. Yes? Well, you talked about SOAP on one extreme. What about the other extreme, using a simpler protocol like R RSS or the URL query string, which returns an unwrapped XML file? Yeah, we actually have, well, we've got a little RSS feed for, um, uh, for our little Spotlights news thing, which we don't update enough to actually keep active enough for people to actually bother to subscribe to it. But yeah, RSS is good for things like um, that new lessons mailing list, for example. Um, I would use RSS to generate a feed of like new lessons. But you could do the same thing. Um, you could generate it as RSS, so to be even simpler. But but part of what part of what we want part of what uh, by by doing it with XML RPC, um, 
it seems to me to give the, the greatest level of, of, you know, sort of freedom to the person on the other side. Plus, I want to be able to do stuff like have people log in, you know. I mean, the students don't come to our website and hang out anyway, so if they can log in and run a lesson from your website, it's not, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. I'm more, much more interested in the fact that they run the lesson, that they do the, you know, that they, that they learn something from this than whether or not they actually visit my website. And, and so those sort of advanced features I wouldn't be able to do in RSS because RSS kind of goes one way and XML RPC can be two ways. But there's plenty of room for RSS stuff on, uh, on the site and, and I hope to, you know, sort of expand those, um, expand those kind of things because I'm a big fan of RSS feeds. Like the, the second tab over, I don't know if you can read it, it's feed on feeds, that's my, my aggregator and I haven't looked at it in like uh, probably five days, so there's probably about 4,000 articles piled up in there. But that's okay, I'll just delete them all and start <laughs> over again. I didn't miss too much. Yeah, yeah I was just wondering, maybe this is a question, but is this all dependent on your website actually? Is this service always being available every time I'm in every time I click on that, making a call to your website, right then? Or is this? Yeah. So it's it's always calling to the website. Like their site. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like their site, but it's actually getting the information from, like, you know, directly from our databases. And, you know, and, and again, the, the key thing there is that then it's always up to date. You know, Emory was one of those places. Is anybody from Emory here? No, let's see if I know some of the, the tech guys are here. Um, Emory was one of those places with, with the description that said, like, you know, 100 lessons. And, you know, because it... You know, it's like one of those things, you sort of like, oh, Callie, you know, we get, you know, we deal with that and we put up there and you, don't, and you don't really think about it. So, you know, having a way to get that information be a lot more current, um, you know, is, 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 you know, is a big deal for us. Yes? Um, just, I guess, more or less a comment. Um, right now, really, we're in, in the process of working with some other people and redesigning how our systems work together. And um, so, taking more of a service-oriented approach desirable for our institutions because of the different types of systems that, from an integration standpoint. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if anybody else has, has really asked them or not, but we're um, kind of trying to work with law services and LCC and stuff for um, having them implement a, uh, a web service so that we can do information exchanges with them that way as opposed to downloading text files right. and manually importing them and create more of a real-time service solution. But I, I have more of a manufacturing background and you know building like supply chain management kind of systems with other with our vendors and things like that. Mm -hmm. It just becomes a, just a much more efficient mechanism for exchanging right. information. And so I don't know if anybody else has had any experience working with uh, Yeah, how's talking to LSAC going for you? Uh, very <laughs> slow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean it, you know, when when we talk to Twin about doing you know, the folks at West about doing you know, it, it, it took them a while to, um, I finally found a, a programmer there on, on, on the twin team who, you know, when he heard this is what I, was, what, what I wanted to do, he was like, yeah, 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 yeah. But then it took a while for it to sort of, you know, I guess he was several layers down in the, the food chain. It took a while for it to sort of build up. Because people don't, this is, this is a thing that people don't, I mean, it's, it's not new exactly. I mean, the, 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 the technology for XML RPC and, and SOAP and stuff like that's been around for four or five years or more, I suppose, at this point. I mean, yeah, I'll be like blogging like five years in October and then it was there when I started, you know, then. So, so it's been around, but it's taken a long time at least to reach into, you know, sort of our community um, in, in any kind of meaningful way. Um, you know, I know, I know a lot of, uh, a lot of the library management system vendors are just starting to add um, RSS feeds. Or they'll sell you the RSS feeds for a lot more money as like an add-on when they're really just a byproduct of what they're doing anyway. <laughs> um, any other questions? What kind of database are you using on your server to store the information? Uh, it's MySQL. Um, we're running we're running Apache um, for the web server. Um, all the coding is in um, 
for, for, for the main Kali website, it's all PHP in the database is, is MySQL. It's working, um, it's working pretty well for us. So I've got to tune a couple of things. We have, um, we have, uh, we'll have sometime in September, we'll go over 50,000 students registered on the site. And we've got, um, we're really close to a million rows in the, because we record every time somebody runs a lesson, we grab some data. And um, that tables up to almost a million rows. Um, because, you know, we're getting more popular all the time. But the database seems to be doing, uh, seems to be holding up well with it. But the database, again, is almost, um, uh, is, is pretty much irrelevant in terms of this. I mean, you just sort of write, you know, the, the SQL for whatever database you need as, as part of the developing the service itself. And what version of MySQL has DHB 5? Uh, no, it's, four, it's MySQL 4.1, I think, and PHP 4.2 something. Yeah, 5's got, I don't have one after to recode. They changed some stuff, especially with the way that PHP handles XML. Um, they changed it to version 5. So a lot of the stuff on their site relies on XML one, one way or another. And um, a lot of it has to be recoded. And that's more than I want to get into. But we probably um, will probably move to MySQL 5 for some of the, the features, especially as we start. Because, for example, students can save scores now when they use the Flash client. They can save their scores. Um, well, we want to make sure that if they hit the score save button, we need to be able to do transactions in the database and stuff, for example, more reliably than we can. And five and do that's going to be helpful. Yes? What, uh, what implementation of XML RPC are you Oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, the, uh, actually, I'm not, I'm not even sure. The XML RPC for, uh, for the XML RPC for PHP, I'm actually using an outside library. Um, but offhand, I forget which one. There are a couple of them. Um, they all work more or less um, equally. They all miss stuff that you can get. I mean, the, the thing is that, like, like, if you're really into web services and you like, really want to do it and do it like really well, you need to do it in Java with SOAP because that's where like all the really, really good tools are. But I don't know Java. <laughs> and, um, you know, so, um, but I can, I can get you that. If you drop me a note, I'll uh, give you the, more of the, the details about what, uh, what's in there. Yes? I know you have the, the developer team. Do you have any way, like, say you want to make some fundamental change to set up everything in a downstream? Do you have a way of, like, you know, through the end or anything? Yeah, only through the developer team. Yeah, because the developer key ties a particular person to the whole thing. The other thing that it does is it lets me track back, like if you, if you actually use the developer key, because technically you don't have to, you know, not terribly like anal about that, but if you actually use it, um, it'll record every time somebody follows one of those links so we have an idea of who using how much. Um, but yeah, the developer key is the um, basically a, a way for me to, to keep track of who's using it. And one thing that um, one thing that, that I would that I would use that for would be to notify people if you make any significant change. Um, right now I don't other than adding things, like I you know the, the, the current plan is to sort of build on what's already there and not you know not backtrack. And as our, as the database has gotten bigger the um, you know we, we you know we won't you know it's Pretty reasonable to expect that we wouldn't do anything like change the data structures that would really trigger our you know, major rewrite on this um, anytime soon. Because we just got through all that. I have absolutely no desire to mess around with that again. Was there anything else over? Anyone? What are the security implications? Using XML RPC. I mean, you're not uploading anything in this case. In this case. Can you set up secure 
a secure protocol of encryption? In theory, you should be able to run it across HTTPS and get um, and get encryption. I haven't tried it, so I don't, I don't know. Um, generally, in like for example, with the blog stuff, where you know actually the, the passwords, well, the throwing stuff over like the, the password is actually sitting there in plain text. Um, in, in, that's actually coded in. That would be pulled out of the database in sort of the, the ultimate implementation of this. But um, yeah, I mean you can do like basically, you, know, you can use, this is written in Perl, so you could use Perl to do like, you know, encryption of like passwords and stuff. I mean I probably wouldn't use it to pass around a lot of sensitive information. Um, but it should work on um, it should work on HTTPS, um, which gives you the a, a layer of a layer of encryption and some security there. So, if, if you don't use a, a session at that level, does it, can you establish a session at the web service level? So, I'm not familiar with. I th I'm or not too sure. I don't know about XML RPC. I know there's more security in SOAP um, than there is in, in XML RPC. Is the nature of like you know, how it developed. I mean, SOAP is a lot more sort of big business. Mm -hmm. um, so they've you know, thought, of, thought a lot more about security than you know, the one guy who wrote the XML RPC thing. So, um, you know, so there's, um, yeah, so, so you, can, you can get some security. I mean, you know, for me, I'm a little dubious about web security generally anyway, and it doesn't stop me from punching credit card numbers all over the place a lot of times. But, but, you know, I mean, you know, I, I, but I do think about it, which is why we haven't done the login part yet, um, until I figure out exactly what the, you know, sort of what the, the parameters around how the security is going to work for that. Because you know. um, I don't want to mess that up. I don't want to, you know, especially with students doing more saving of, of scores or faculty assigning them lessons, it's like right now, a faculty member could go in and create a lesson link and then have the students run that and save their scores, and the faculty member could look at the student's scores. Okay. So you, you have to think a lot more about security in that kind of situation because you want to make sure that, um, well, you know, of course, you can't guarantee. That's you know one thing about Cali. You can't guarantee that the person who said they did the lesson actually did the lesson. Anyway, not with the way we've got stuff now. Um, but uh, you know, unless we start issuing everybody certificates and that sort of stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, you can get more security here. Yes? Do you have any issues with, or have you considered the issue of if someone was constantly uh, making requests to server, perhaps they have to be an expensive query? Overloading the services of the new service site. Does that probably have to be a factor of being able to control it? I probably <laughs> notice. Um, and since, since I, because, because I write the, the, the queries, I, I try to make them you know, as, as tight as possible. But it is possible that somebody <laughs> can do something like that. Like um, the you know, know, search engine. Right. Yeah. Right. The search engine. Right. Um, hasn't been a problem. Yeah, it hasn't been a problem. And, and so I don't, you know, I mean, that sort of stuff like kind of crosses my mind. And I've done like load testing on the servers and stuff. And, you know, it, it, it take a, the, the main server is actually here in Chicago. And I think Ken's been with the give out before the, <laughs> the <laughs> before the server did. Oh, um, yeah, you can. I mean, I, I, I was actually trying to, uh, I was trying to run a query to find out what schools weren't sending people to the conference, and I got the join wrong, and fired off the code, <coughs> and had to reboot the server. So you got to you know, watch out for that stuff sometime. And eventually, it would have stopped after it after it finished sort of joining you know sixty thousand records to themselves an infinite number of times. Um, but it was happily off and on. <coughs> Um, but yes, I'm very careful about like those, the, like any queries that are exposed to the public, uh, that sort of stuff. It's funny when I do it. It makes me mad. 
Um, and, 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 and we do we do check for things like um, you know like sort of doing like buffer overflows and that kind of stuff. So it doesn't you know, it doesn't really come in on it. So. Yeah. Anybody else? For testing purpose, like have you mirrored a site and uh, doing the same thing like before you load it to the production server? Yeah, usually. <laughs> this is happening one of those things where I was like, yeah, I was like, I wonder. <laughs> Which I, you know, I just sometimes you just do it because it's just like, you know. But yeah, usually we, we test someplace else. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, anybody? Real that? Cool, coffee. <laughs> Thank you.
So sometimes they get Actually, again, I think it's going to be a lot of work because we can't see the Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, you know, we, we did it, and we actually did some of it as part of the movement that we did so we can get all the But it's, it's cool that you can now update and everything to yeah. keep the yeah. whole standard with what you guys have. Yeah, so like when the new tax lessons come out in a couple weeks, you know, you want to feel like that is a lot like
Yeah, it's actually not that. It's, it's actually this part. It is harder because there's no GUI, so you have to deal with. You have to deal with. Right. You have to be able to write the config files. But I know, you know, so much about Apache's ACVD. I can I can make virtual. I can I can I can you know parse out virtual servers in my sleep. I do that. Well, the, the, the blogging thing with the, with the audio, that's actually set up so that when you create the blog, you can name your blog, and, and it, it just creates, it um, actually is a wild part of the DNS record, which is scary, but, um, and then the patch uses that wild part and sends the, sends the string along and the blogging stuff where it's not. So, you know, you can create, you know, a twin dot, class caster dot, or you can go, okay. You know, off we go. And so, you know, that was, uh, that was close. But, you know, um, you know, with, you know, we, we moved, because we had, um, we were going to run a, 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 I mean, the phone system blocking things, you know, is running on, so I just bought a Dell, like a one new that's running a Xeon 2.8 gig processor with like a gig of RAM and like 173 gig SCSI drive, 1460 plus. I can buy a lot of them. Yeah, right. you know. Well, um, I mean, it's not very much to that. It's very special. Yeah. That's my bad. Yeah. yeah. Well, right. And, and the thing is, is that, you know, when, when, we, when we do that, that gives us you know, sort of some flexibility. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah